want to thank you for that this opportunity. So I'm I'm going to read two pieces. The first is a poem written by Bruce Dore, a very prominent Queensland writer, and it's a very interesting poem because it contains my discipline in its title. Uh, the poem is called White Water Rafting and Palliative Care for My Late Wife Gloria. If I had understood when down the river you and I went swirling in that boat that there were those who knew the ways of water and how to use the oars to keep afloat, I might have been less deafened by the worry, less stunned by thoughts of what lay up ahead, the rocks, the darkness threatening to capsize daily. If I'd only realised instead that help was all around me for the asking, I never asked and therefore never knew that such additional comfort could have helped me in turn to be more help in comforting you. I'd have found it easier then to simply hold you instead of bobbing to and fro so much, for it was you who seemed to be more tranquil and I whom death was reaching out to touch. If I'd only had sufficient knowledge in that white water rafting, I'd have learned that there are those around us with life jackets to whom I might have in that turmoil turned. Instead, because I had not thought of rivers or rocks or rapids and gave way to fears that seeking help might make a man less manly and liable to betray himself with tears, I was less useful then as twilight deepened than I might well have been had I but known. However wild the waves are all around us, no one needs to live or die alone. It's wonderful language, isn't it? It's and, and one it analogy. Is. Yeah. And it's a great, I think it's a great, wonderful it's analogy of, of sudden, you know, losing you, you, your normal life and your control with an illness, your serious illness. Now you're on the cascade of this river. I love the fact that in that boat is not just the patient but her husband, I guess the sense of a family. And how death is reaching out not only to yeah, her but yeah, to him. To yeah. him as well, that's right. And also it's, it's a poem of great regret because had I but known, yeah. we, we had no idea about palliative care until later. And um, as he told me, I actually contacted him to get permission to write a, a, a sort of a pricey on that poem. And he said, no, no, we didn't, we're in, it was in rural Queensland. They didn't know about that until later. And also the recognition that um, palliative care wouldn't be, uh, would, was not, he wasn't, the aim wasn't to get them off the river, it was just to give them some modicum of control. It's interesting. But that remarkable phrase, those who know the ways of water, we do as doctors, hopefully. We have a sense of this. And so that's a, a very powerful um, sense of trust in us, isn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, so this now is my uh, one of my... Um, one of my short uh, medical narratives, and the background of this is um, I spent a, about a year in Ireland. Uh, oh, once, wow. once I finished great, once I uh, finished my training, I went over to Ireland for a year, and now I'm entering a land of storytellers. This is a very, yes. very strong sense of uh, of uh, storytelling, poetry, and music, and death and dying, and a very deep way of looking at things. So, so it was fascinating to have every patient Irish, of course, and all. Or I was there in a, um, yeah, it was very, very good. So the story is, um, the story is called The Woman from County Meath. The warmth of the Dublin day caught everyone by surprise. Through the window I could see children playing in the garden. We had walked into the visitor's room. The family was waiting. They were from County Meath. He was a farmer, only 54 years, she a teacher. They had seven children. It was clear that he was dying. He had battled seemingly intractable pain, but now, over the past few days, was much more settled. I spoke about these days and what to expect from this point onwards. I then concentrated on the family themselves and recommended, as we do, the usual things, that they each take turns with being in being with him, that they try to eat and sleep, that they talk to each other, in short, to look after themselves through this vigil. I turned to the patient's wife and said, I know you've been here all the time. It might be good to go and have a rest, even just for a little while. There was a long silence. She looked at me as though down a passage. She turned her head to one side, looked out the window, then towards me again and said, No, I will not be leaving him. She spoke tenderly of their first meeting at age 17, of their courting and their wedding day, of their marriage and the birth of their children. She spoke in soft, beautiful phrases, then sentences that began plainly but became brilliant, each seemingly more evocative than the last. And with every memory of their life together, each reflection she would end by saying, no, 
I will not be leaving him, until that phrase repeated became the tolling of a distant bell. And then she said something that I've never heard expressed in the same way before. She said that from their wedding day they were united, that they were, as the prayer states, one body, and that as he had fallen ill, so had she, that as he was suffering, so was she, and that as he lay dying, so was she. No James Joyce, no Oscar Wilde, no Samuel Beckett could have put it so powerfully. As Angela Murphy, the palliative care nurse with me in the room that day, said later, she was saying what he was feeling. In many ways, of course, she wasn't talking to us. She was speaking across the vast sea of their lives. I had spoken at a practical level about rest. The response I received was from a person adrift on that sea, not wanting to leave or soften the fate. Too often, as doctors, we speak practically and are heard emotionally. And perhaps that is our life. Andrew and I left the room and walked back onto the ward. We were both too moved to say much. Later that, that day, Angela rang me and said, Frank, we may never hear the like of that again. When I returned to Australia, I was asked to present some memories from Ireland. I contacted Angela. Without prompting, she said, of course, you'll talk about the woman from me. And in distant years, if I ever were to encounter Angela Murphy again, walking down O'Connell Street in Dublin, or perhaps George Street in Sydney, we would stop and no doubt remember the woman from me who spoke to us of a love that was boundless, a union that was indissolvable and who gave us a momentary glimpse into the mystery at the heart of it all. What a wonderful clip that was. Hey, if you want more highlight clips of the Doctors Getting Coffee podcast, then don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below and make sure you hit the bell icon next to it to get notifications whenever there's a new highlight clip. I'm releasing sometimes four or even five clips per week. Then make sure you hit that button. Now, if you want to watch the entire video podcast, consider becoming a Patreon or a YouTube member to support the channel and you will get as one of your special privileges, access to the entire video podcast library. I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.